Good morning. I'm David Somerville, the minister at Holcombe Brook Methodist Church and Seedfield Methodist Church in Bury. Whatever the time of day is with you and wherever you are, please know that you are most welcome as you join us today. Before we start our service, you may be aware that this week the Methodist Conference voted in favour of the resolutions contained within the report God in Love Unites Us regarding marriage and relationships. Amongst other things, this permits Methodist churches to host same-sex weddings, which as you can understand has been a contentious matter. The President and Vice President of Conference have issued a pastoral letter and asked that it be read out today, followed by a letter from the Reverend Paul Martin, our Chair of District. A pastoral letter from the President and Vice President following the Conference vote on marriage and relationships. We wish to take this opportunity to write to you after the conference voted on the resolutions contained in the Marriage and Relationships Report. We very much appreciate that these decisions will stir up many different emotions for our siblings across the connection. There will be some who will be deeply hurt and others who will rejoice by what has been decided. Our presidential theme this year is God's Table an invitation for all. And God's invitation is for every single one of us. The Methodist Church has held tension for many years, and as a church and a family we must do all we can to live with contradictory convictions. This work was first reflected on back in 1992, and we've been on this journey together since that point. During the past years, we have continued to listen to and to pray for each other and remaining true to what God is saying to us. We must remember in all this to continue to hold each other in prayer and to support each other as we find a way forward, respecting our differences. It's perhaps helpful to remember that there are other issues, as some of them discussed at the conference, on which we hold differing and sometimes strong opinions. We live with them, and we do not allow them to impair our communion with each other. We respect each other's consciences. We exercise judgment in when to speak and when to be silent. And we hold one another in prayer. We do all this not for our own sake, but for the sake of Christ and the sake of the world, which urgently needs to know the power of God's of reconciling love. Our prayer for you, beloved siblings, is that in joy or sorrow, in pain or excitement, we may continue to live within that reconciling love. Signed, the Reverend Sonia Hicks, President of the Conference, and Mrs. Barbara Easton, Vice President of the Conference. So ends the letter. And now a letter from the Reverend Paul Martin, our District Chair. Dear friends, the Methodist Conference meeting in Birmingham and online agreed the proposals contained in God in Love Unites Us, with some minor modifications. I quote one of the speakers who has been a leading and inspiring evangelical in the Methodist Church for many years, the Reverend Paul Smith. This is no time for triumphalism. Let me be completely honest and open with you. For over 40 years I have hoped and prayed for a more inclusive attitude towards people in what is now called the LGBTQ plus community. But on Wednesday, when all the votes had been cast, I felt a sense of sadness because I couldn't help but think of all those in the district and beyond for whom this decision causes pain. We are a divided church on so many issues, but for some this is particularly hard. I continue to believe that there are safeguards in place for ministers who, out of conscience, cannot marry same-sex couples. I continue to believe that it is proper that church councils have the right to decide whether their church building can be used for conducting such marriages. I know that this is difficult for some to accept. 
while for others it opens up new opportunities and they will rejoice in what has been decided. I hope those hurting people will remain faithful to the Methodist Church. Important as the issues raised by God and Love Unites Us are, there are so many other matters which occupy us as individual Christians and churches. We will not just be weaker as a church if people leave, but we will be less diverse and spiritually poorer. If anyone feels the need for a conversation with me, then please get in touch. I resume my sabbatical on Monday the 5th of July, but I regard this as such an important issue that I'm happy to engage if anyone wishes to do so. God bless. Paul Thank you for listening to these two letters. And now our service. Our service this morning is led by Carolyn Jones and our readings are brought to us by Fiona and Heidi Platt. Today we are looking at what makes for successful mission. And now Carolyn will lead us in our call to worship. Good morning everyone. Our call to worship today is taken from the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 to 22. Now therefore you, we, are no longer strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles, apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So as we come to worship as the household of God still living in these times of uncertainty we declare that our hope is in Christ knowing that he is with us whatever we're facing in all our circumstances and we sing with confidence cornerstone paying particular attention to the words when darkness seems to hide his face i rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the saviour's love through the storm he is lord lord of all the worship band leads us as we sing
Let's pray. Dear Lord, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, we praise you that you are the cornerstone, affirming who we are, grounding us in you, extravagantly loving us and accepting us as your sons and daughters because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We praise you that you're completely trustworthy and that we can anchor our lives on you, that you never change, that you're constant, as is your love for us, and that you are our very help in times of trouble. We thank you and praise you that you know us completely, intimately, through and through, and you still love us. And Father, this morning, we want to thank and praise you that there is nowhere we can go where you're not there. As the psalmist says, we can go to the highest of heights and the deepest of depths, and you are there. There's nowhere we can hide. We thank you for your unconditional love for us and that you sent Jesus so that we can live in your love. Thank you for all the blessings you shower on us day by day, causing the sun to rise and set, ordering the seasons, putting us in relationships with one another and with you. Lord, as we come into your presence, you make us aware of how we fall short of your standards. We say and do and think things which are not worthy of you. So we take a moment now to say how sorry we are for the times when we deny you by our thoughts, words or actions. We claim your promise that because of Jesus' sacrifice, you will forgive us and welcome us back into relationship with you. We turn away from the wrong things that we do, think or say, and hear the words of grace that because of Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Amen. And now Fiona and Heidi Platt will bring our Bible readings. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. There was such a large crowd along the shore that he got into a boat and sat down and spoke from there. He began to teach the people by telling many stories such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on a footpath and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The plant sprang up quickly, but it soon wilted beneath the hot sun and died because the roots had no nourishment in the shallow soil. Other seed fell among thorns that shot up and choked out the tender blades so that it produced no grain. Still other seed fell on fertile soil and produced a crop that was 30, 60 and even a hundred times as much as had been planted. Then he said, anyone who is willing to hear should listen and understand. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 6, 1 to 13. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished. They asked, where did he get all his wisdom and he, the power to perform such miracles? He's just the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon. They were deeply offended and refused to believe him. When Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any mighty miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Jesus sent out the 12 apostles then Jesus went out from village to village, teaching, and he called his twelve disciples together and sent them out two by two. 
with authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing with them except a walking stick, no food, no traveller's bag, no money. He told them to wear sandals, but not to take even an extra coat. When you enter each village, be a guest in only one home, he said. And if a village won't welcome you or listen to you, shake off its dust from your feet as you will leave. It is a sign that you have abandoned this village to its fate. So the disciples went out, telling all they met to turn from their sins, and they cast out many demons and, heal it, and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. Let us pray. May the written word through the spoken word lead us to an encounter with the risen eternal word, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How would you score yourself out of 10 as a Christian? How would you score your church in terms of their mission? How would you score Jesus versus his disciples. Our Gospel reading presents two extremes of missional outcomes. The first was when Jesus went to the synagogue in Nazareth. This was his hometown. They had known him since he was knee-high to a grasshopper. They were very familiar with who he was as he was growing up. He was one of their own, someone who they expected to fit in with their expectations they expected him to know his place. This idea that he was a prophet was just so much nonsense. How dare you have ideas above your station? Would it be fair to score Jesus based on this encounter? We're told that he couldn't do any miracles there except lay his hand on a few folk who were healed. I'm very wary of accusing someone of not having enough faith. If someone is ill and asks for prayer and I pray for them only for them not to be healed, it adds insult to injury to say that the reason they were not healed was because they didn't have enough faith. On the other hand, it could be that someone is so against faith that God cannot work. It's interesting that often it was the religious types who were set in their ways, who had closed their minds off to faith. A scary and a challenging thought. I wonder if we had to grade the people of Nazareth into the soil types of the parable, which would they be? Would they be the stony places without much soil, the stones being their intransigence? And if we're judging them, how would we be judged? Sometimes we can be so fixed in our interpretation of scripture or our reliance on church tradition and the way we've always done it, that we're unable to adapt to the movement of the spirit. But would you score Jesus down because of the lack of response? The other extreme is that of the disciples. They were set quite a challenging task, one that I might have balked at. The instructions were quite clear. Take nothing for the journey apart from a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belt. Wear sandals but not an extra shirt. When you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if you're not welcomed, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet. Wow, that's quite a challenge. Would you not be tempted to have some cash on you just in case? Take your credit card or whatever. Jesus is asking his disciples to put themselves in a position where they have to rely on him or other people to get by. I remember listening to Miriam Swaffield, as she was then, the leader of the Charity Fusion, which helps to link students with churches in the, in the cities where they're studying. Each year they would set a challenge. Students would pay to go on a journey. They would be instructed to turn up at an airport, not knowing where they were going. They would be given a return ticket to a destination in Europe with 24 euros cash in total. Their task was to spend a weekend in that destination witnessing to Christ and praying for folk that they met. They would have no given accommodation, no means of transport, no provision other than the 24 euros which wouldn't go very far. 
She told of flying out to Milan, having arrived in the city. Having arrived there, they went into one of the main churches in the city centre to ask for help. As they knocked on the door, police arrived and advised them to move on as the area was not safe. Clearly they were praying as they went. They were also on social media letting everyone know what they were doing. It turned out that one of their friends living in Britain was from Milan. She texted them to get the train from Milan to one of the suburbs where they would be met. They were met by their friend's mother, who was very lonely after her family had flown the nest. It turned out that she was a fantastic cook, provided them with great meals and they provided her with the company that she needed. As they went back into Milan, they prayed with folk and saw people healed, miracles happening and came back home rejoicing, all because they'd stepped out in faith. That was the experience of the disciples. They went and God did amazing things. Clearly, if you were to fit them into the parable of the sower, you would class the soil as good soil, where a crop multiplying 30, 60 or 100 times would grow. Would you then say that the disciples were better at mission than Jesus? I think not, but there are some questions that we need to ask. How much are we responsible for the success or the failure of our mission? Sometimes it's not at all clear where the good soil is. We do what we can, but it can be very much a scattergun approach where the results are based on the responsiveness of the people with whom we meet. I wonder also whether we prepare ourselves to be witnesses to Christ. Jesus required his disciples to put themselves in a situation where they had to rely on his supernatural power to aid them in their situation. To any rational way of thinking, it was madness to kick away the support structure that we have and make ourselves totally vulnerable. Charity law dictates that we work to ensure that our churches are financially viable. In other words, we have the resources to do what we set out to do. That makes a lot of sense, but it means that we rely, we enable ourselves to rely on our own resources and don't need to rely on God. And secondly, we set our goals and targets so low based on our own resources. Gil Rendell tells of a dispute in a church with whom he was working. He set a group to search through the whole Bible and find a passage that spoke to their situation. They thought this would be an impossible task, but given this challenge, they set to work. Eventually, they settled on the story of two sisters, Martha and Mary. You can read about this in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. Martha was all fussed because there was so much to do to provide hospitality for Jesus and his disciples. Rather than helping her, Mary chose to sit and listen to Jesus. The group recognised that the church leadership wanted to move the church forward and take risks, doing new things. The church managers were seeking to keep the church going by maintaining the status quo and not rocking the boat. The two were at lockerheads. Last week we saw that it was only out of desperation that the woman reached out with a mustard seed of faith to touch Jesus' robe, and Jairus' daughter was a so close to death that he went to Jesus. What does it take to break us out of our desire to maintain the status quo so that we'll be willing to aim for the kingdom goals that Jesus wants us to achieve? We heard last week from Lindsay of how the decision to invest in technology for streaming services pushed her out of her comfort zone. She could have responded as Gil Rendell's managers would do and say no. Instead, she turned to prayer and God provided the means. The challenge for me as a church leader is to spend enough time being close to God to be able to discern what his will is, to be guided to where the good soil is, to know when to take risks and when to step back.
That applies to us all in the decisions that we make, whether they're the day-to-day -day decisions or ones that are life-changing. At the beginning, I asked who was the better at mission, Jesus or his disciples. It was an unfair question. I hope that you can see that the outcome depends on the environment in which we're working, the good or bad soil, but also how responsive we are to the leading of God's Spirit and whether we are willing to let go and let God. It's perhaps unwise to be advocating that we be irresponsible, but which is more irresponsible? To limit our sights to the safest option, like the servant who took his master's money and buried it, rather than investing it, or to be as close as we can to God's will, trusting that he will guide us to fruitful outcomes and growth. I pray that as we emerge from what we hope will be a post-COVID environment, we'll be willing to be risk-takers for God, seeking to be ever closer to him, so that we may discern what he is calling us to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. As part of our sharing stories from our lives time, we welcome Hazel this week, who's going to tell us about some of her experiences of living out her faith. Thank you, Hazel. As a Christian, I've always very much had a heart for those who are poor and marginalised. Um, a friend of mine was forever trying to send me up the Amazon with yellow wellies, but that wasn't where God was calling me and I knew that. It was just a joke. However, when an opportunity arose to go to Romania, I absolutely jumped at the chance. This was with Spurgeon's and the Rotary Club and it involved two short visits to a place called Yash in northeast Romania and was an opportunity for me to really test whether that was a place that I should be going, whether God wanted me there. On my second visit, as I walked down Stephen Chelmari, I felt such a sense of peace, such a sense of that this is home, that I knew that this really was of God. From that visit, I was able to arrange to go back in the summer and spend four weeks in Yash. And this was when the real fun began. My challenge may well have been different to the disciples, I was allowed to take luggage with me, although my luggage was mainly filled with things for other people. The real challenge then was travelling and getting to Yash. This involved getting two planes, and once you got to Bucharest, there was still another 200 miles to go to get to Yash, involving taxis and trains and various things. We got to the airport and thought, right, how on earth do I get to the station? But God sent me some other people who helped me to get there, which was wonderful. The journey, I say, is about 200 miles, so similar to doing from Manchester to London. However, instead of that less than two hours, it's a six hour train ride on a train which doesn't quite look like a virgin train. When we got to Yash, I discovered there were two train stations in Yash, which nobody had ever told me before. However, again, there were people around who helped and I really just felt that God was absolutely in this. I arrived at the main train station in Yash to be met by people who I had no idea who I was looking for. They had no idea what I looked for, right? but they found me. Um, I think I just stood out in the crowd. And then they pointed out they got their Union Jacks on their t-shirts to help me know that it was them I was looking for, which was lovely. And this was my first meeting with Nina, a single mum with five children. And I went to stay at her house. None of them spoke any English. My Romanian was more than basic. Um, so between us we managed and we used the dictionary was our friend. I was very much welcome there. You know, Jesus said, stay where you're welcome. I was so loved and so welcomed in that house. It was amazing. And also by the two Baptist churches, which we got involved with. And through them met various people who would become really important later on. On my very last day of that month, a lady called Elaine, who was a missionary in Yash, took me to the dystrophic clinic and that was to become very, very important when I returned. When I came back home after that month, I spoke to the head of the school I was working at. Fortunately, this was the head who understood when you went and said, I think God's sending me to Romania. And she was quite happy to let me go for a year, obviously as an unpaid leave, um, but to retain my job so I would be able to come back at the following year. So in September 98, I went back off to Yash going to Nina's house again, this time knowing where I was going, although it was still an interesting journey. 
my luggage was still largely for others. And now I was living from savings and from gifts from church and rotary clubs. I did take my credit card, as David was suggesting, perhaps the disciples might have liked. But using it in Romania proved to be very interesting. Um, they weren't really widely known and it took a very long time to buy a washing machine for the family, which I really felt it was important to do to help them. We managed it eventually, but it took 20 minutes to take my payment. I was in very many ways dependent on the family I was living with, on the churches, on the other missionaries in the city. Those are the people who fed me, who taught me the language, who taught me how to move around Romania to the point that Stuart Martin said I was a talking bus timetable. However, I can't find my way in the car. The two places that became very important were the hospital school and the dystrophic clinic. I'd met somebody who worked in the hospital school and was really desperate to get me in there as a native English speaker. They wanted me to go in and do lessons with the children, which I did, although it turned out to be sort of one-off activities because most of those children were changing all the time. However, there were some who were long stay there and one young man I particularly remember who had leukaemia, who sadly died before we left but who was so thrilled to have somebody who cared enough to just go and spend time and teach them some English and silly songs and things like that. The dystrophic clinic was for babies who were malnourished. These children were brought by their parents, usually from the villages outside of the city. Very poor families who couldn't feed their children. And once the children were there, they weren't able to get back and visit them because they hadn't got the money and those children generally ended up abandoned there. Sadly, it was still very much as you've seen on TV with children left in cots all day. The staff felt their job was to feed the children, to change the children, but couldn't get their head around the idea that it was quite okay to talk while you were feeding children and talk to them while you're changing them. I think the good thing is that gradually we broke through there and there was a point where they would allow someone to go in and do some training with them, just on that child development and spending time with them. Two children particularly stand out to me, um, Anna Maria, who followed me out one day as I was leaving and I took her back yet again to her cot thinking I'm sure I've done this once. I put her back in her cot, I knew I'd done it this time and she reappeared again. It was very difficult to find the staff to take her back to her room. And the other little girl was a little girl called Nellie who took a shine to Liz Martin who came out for a little while as well. They liked to sit on the floor playing row the boat and Nellie's first two words that she spoke, at two and a half, maybe even going on three, she said, row, 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 and mare, mare, mare. Sad that her first words were in English because the Romanian staff didn't speak to her. I think my mission was far more in action than in words, but I also believe that, at that, point, that through being there, I encouraged the local church. I grew, the people around me grew. And at least three of Nina's children are now sponsoring other children through compassion. So they're sponsoring children in very poor parts of the world. My heart still remains very much in Romania and I really can't help but sing Che Mare Yesht whenever we're singing How Great Thou Art and yeah, How Great Is God. Thank you, Hazel, for sharing with us this morning. It's really good to hear stories of how God works in people's lives. And so now we bring our prayers for others. We're going to use the Matt Redmond song, Jesus, Your Name, to help us as we make our prayers. Although we're changing the words slightly from I to we. So the response is, I will say, Jesus, Your Name, when the whole world shakes, Jesus, your name we will ever praise. Our battle cry every night and day. Please respond. We'll sing your name over everything. We'll sing your name over everything. So almighty God, we pray for situations throughout the world which are so completely beyond our understanding. For areas of conflict, the COVID pandemic, injustice, inequality and suffering in all its forms. Jesus, your name, when the whole world shakes. Jesus, your name, we will ever praise. 
our battle cry every night and day we'll sing your name over everything we'll sing your name over everything and we pray for all who are struggling to make sense of their current situations and for all who are fearful for the future Jesus, your name, when the whole world shakes. Jesus, your name, we will ever praise. Our battle cry every night and day. We'll sing your name over everything. We'll sing your name over everything. We pray for all who are suffering in mind, body or spirit, bringing to you those who we know and maybe even ourselves. Jesus, your name, when the whole world shakes. Jesus, your name, I will ever, we will ever praise. Our battle cry every night and day. We'll sing your name over everything. We'll sing your name over everything. And finally, we pray for ourselves that you will make us faithful witnesses to you, that you will draw us ever closer to Jesus, making us more like him day by day, and that you'll fill us with your Holy Spirit, helping us to share your love with everyone we meet. We ask that the words we say and the actions we make will speak out of our love for you and for each other and pray that people will be drawn to seek you for themselves. Jesus, your name, when the whole world shakes. Jesus, your name, we will ever praise. Our battle cry, every night and day, we'll sing your name over everything. We'll sing your name over everything. And now let's pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our final song reminds us that we can do nothing on our own. We can only be effective witnesses to our faith in God as he leads and equips us. So we pray that God will fill us with his spirit as the worship band leads us in singing, I will go in the strength of the Lord.
Thank you for being with us today. We would love to hear from you. Please contact us at bit, that is B-I-T dot L-Y slash Seedfield, and we'll come back to you. Thank you. And now a blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Here are some questions for you to consider either on your own or with others. Firstly, in the Christian life, what do we define as success and how should we measure it? Secondly, were the disciples better missionaries than Jesus? Why or why not? Thirdly, how well can we tell the difference between good soil and rocky soil in our outreach? How do we decide on where to apply our resources and efforts? Fourthly, how would you have reacted to Jesus' instructions to his disciples? Fifthly, does the success of mission require us to be on the edge, that is, wholly reliant on Jesus? Does being self-sufficient or being good managers of our resources work against this? And finally, in Gil Rendell's comparison of leaders and managers with Mary and Martha, which camp would you be in and why? May God bless you as you consider these questions and may you know his presence and his leading in this coming week. God bless you.